question about the, the face, so the uh, primate faces. Mm -hmm. um, there's, in, you might be familiar with in the, in the human psychology literature, there's, there's um, lots of studies about individual identity perception mm -hmm. and how it works. And one of the ideas is that confusional processing is important. So the arrangement of the parts mm -hmm. and the relationship to yeah. each other. And you can actually make faces very difficult to recognize by taking mm -hmm. a picture and just slightly moving the eyes yeah. farther away from each other or whatever. Suddenly it looks like a different person. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if, if, in your case, the naked faces mm -hmm. might be allowing more individual identity recognition. Mm -hmm. We were talking about, I think, um, some of the intent, you know, the emotional cues that you could get. But yeah. it seems like another thing might be in, in highly social groups where it pays to recognize other individuals. Maybe all the fancy colors mm -hmm. make it harder to identify individuals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does that seem? Yeah, that seems like a, like a really good point. Uh, we don't have data <laughs> to test that at, the, at this moment, but it's a, it's a really interesting possibility. I do agree that it might, because especially the, the types of cue that, that a lot of primates tend to focus on, like the eye, the eye region, uh, you could see how those could be uh, more salient if, if there's a face that is bare. So, yeah, it's completely I mean, you could possible. Almost do it. I, yeah. I don't know if human subjects would be. The Maybe right go humans. Thing, but, you, but you could, as a star, it would be yeah. really interesting. You could actually do it if you had individual photos. Yeah. You could do sort of an A B, um, you know, uh, individual discrimination test mm -hmm. with just human subjects, mm -hmm. these monkeys, and see if the ones, see if there's differences across the species yeah. and how well people can tell apart. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Individuals. Um, yeah, yeah, that would be really with humans. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, but, say, but yeah, at, yeah, but yeah. Calibrated to the dimensions of variation, but it could be a start. Definitely, that's a really good idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't know which one was first. Okay, go ahead. Um, so back to the, the primates. Mm -hmm. um, so you showed two different regressions. Mm -hmm. I can't remember exactly what it was, but the. Being in small groups related uh, was related to more complex spaces, mm -hmm. and then there was another one as well. Uh, um, living with a higher number of close uh, relatives. Yes, so that's what it was. Yeah. So then I wondered if um, there was any, if, you, if those two regressions control for any possible interaction between those. Um, yeah. They do. Yeah. They do. Yeah. They so do. those are independent. Effects. They are. They are. Yeah. And I tested okay. for. Correlation between those two before I put them in the regression yeah, and yeah. they're not, yeah. That's yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering why you have an effect of um, kind of the importance of interspecific recognition mm -hmm. in the primates, but why would it be about faces specifically? Um, you showed some just pictures of other animals mm -hmm. that had kind of these diverse color patterns, mm -hmm. um, possibly for species recognition purposes, but it's not necessarily concentrated in the faces, is it? I mean, is there yeah. like order of taxa differences between where the species recognition signals are distributed, and do you have any ideas why? Yeah, mm -hmm. most likely, and, and actually it's, it's really interesting that these actual patterns emerge even without accounting for all these other types of sensory modalities, like you know, sounds and smells, and, and we still find a strong uh, signal. I can tell you a little bit about the preliminary results that we're finding with the carnivores, uh, and we're finding nothing. There's nothing <laughs> between social group and, and color patterns. And, and that's kind of what we expected to find, because they are more tuned towards olfactory cues and, and auditory cues. And they're not looking a lot at each other's faces, whereas primates are, are really engaging in using this kind of information. So it definitely, it's definitely going to vary across different, different groups. And perhaps if we change the neotropical primates, we look at very specific lineages uh, and then account for those type of, of sensory modalities, it might be that, that that signal is lost because they're, they're using other type of modalities. But at a broad range across the whole group, we do find that relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm just wondering why you landed on uh, this method of basically summing different colors yeah. as opposed to using something like a striking Facial mm -hmm. feature like the, the mustache on the camera yeah. and, yeah. um, and things like that. Because that one would actually, that one, even though it has this incredibly striking and recognizable pattern, right. um, it's, it has a lower score than some of the other. Right, but it's only, the thing is that it's only one character, so it's present in one lineage and then none on the others. So we can't really do anything in terms of relating 
yeah. uh, or, or we, we can't learn a, a lot of uh, about the evolution of the face as a whole because it's one character. And I mean, people have looked at a lot, like you know, red color patches in mandrels, for example, and and um, their evolution in relationship with visual systems. Uh, but we wanted something that looked at the, uh, the pattern as a whole uh, across the species. We could focus on on particular features or contrasting colorations might be interesting yeah, that's to look what at. I was sort of yeah. Instead of number of colors, if it was something like yeah, that, yeah, definitely that, that's something. That's something right. That's something that I think would be really interesting. And one way to get to that is since we have the pigmentation scores, we could look at um, what's the, just the, the difference between the lightest color and the darkest color and get a, a, a you know, a measure of um, contrast within the face, for example. Uh, two unrelated um, points. One is um, you didn't me mention sexual selection at mm -hmm. all. And, and holding sexual dimorphism aside, it would seem that in your um, New World Primates result, sexual selection is not explaining things because one might expect that it would be positively correlated with group size. And so if the complexity of facial coloration is a, offers a, 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 an a, an opportunity for display of variation in quality than you would expect it to scale with group size and it went the other way. So yeah. that seems to suggest that holding dimorphism aside, that's not driving a lot of this. Mm -hmm. I'm curious your thoughts on that. And then I, I have another question, which is a methodological question, and, and I'm, I'm woefully ignorant of these things, but I was a little concerned when you showed us your map of different parts of South America mm -hmm. with um, different sections of the face being explained with regard to different mm -hmm. rules. I get why around the eyes we might see um, darkening in a functional fashion to reduce glare, but I worry that um, that some of those other rules might predict any positive result there, right? So why thermal regulation here and not here, for example, or not here? I mean, you might think that you know the nose is intimately connected to the brain, regulating brain temperature is really important. Um, that is, how do you how how can we be assured that you aren't picking and choosing positive results to your firm? Uh, yeah. Well, the, the positive results that I showed today were the only ones that are positive. We didn't get an array of, of results that were positive and then, and then show only uh, a subset of them. And, and in terms of the actual mechanism that, that explains these rules, that's still kind of controversial. I kind of gave the overall uh, view, but there's still a lot of arguing of whether this evolution of these darker regions really has to do with thermal regulation, but could also do with camouflage. So we still don't know what the actual uh, mechanism is. Um, for some parts of the face, also, uh, is tends to be an extension of the rest of the body. For example, the crown of the head tends to be related with just the dorsal part uh, of the whole animal. So that's just picking the signal of what's happening probably to the dorsal part of the animal. But but again, the, me the mechanism is still it's still unc unclear, and then once I guess once there's more experimental evidence of what uh, these colors are actually doing for the species, maybe we can get more at why, why specific parts of the face and why not. And then I forgot your first sexual question. Selection. Oh, sexual selection. Yeah. So we haven't we haven't looked at that yet, but we have some data that we could use. I can tell you that we, we ran some of these analysis by using. Um, for example, different mores within a species, or uh, by using the females instead of the males, and the trends are the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> yeah. In the, in the primates, um, well, if, if individual recognition using facial expressions is presumably most important at, at distances, so when you're close up to someone, you can use other mm -hmm. olfactory uh, indicators and so forth. So. I want, I'm not sure if you can do this with the comparative data, but I wonder if you could consider the intensity of intergroup competition and um, the extent to which uh, uh, prevailing in an intergroup encounter is a function of just group size versus the identities of particular individuals. Right. So if you know, you can see, oh, you know, that's that's the group with Fred, mm -hmm. and they can always beat us. So let's just you know, not even get <laughs> close. And so, is there any way to incorporate those into these? Yeah. Things? So that that it's a, a link to a future direction of the study that's looking at the actual intraspecific variation, which is a little bit harder to quantify. So those more subtle uh, details. And I guess once we can get those data one way or the other, then I think we can get to, to those more interesting questions, also what's happening within the species. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, just a couple questions. So, <clears throat> so a bunch of these guys are territorial, right? Mm -hmm. um, owl monkeys, mm -hmm. uh, monosets, and tamarins. You might think that the, 
it'd be more important to know who is the same species as you if you're a ter territorial creature than if you're a, uh, you know, if you just have home ranges because you're defending your territory against, uh, you know, potentially usurpers, but not all those other guys that are eating something different. Is there, if you divide it up that way, territorial versus uh, rather than group size, do you get, do you get the same? I, we haven't done that yet, but that's a really interesting, yeah, suggestion. Yeah. Maybe that's a problem because uh, animals living in smaller groups tend to be the sure, ones that are territorial. Yeah. And you don't know what you don't know which ones which, right? Yeah. So, but, uh, and the other thing is just a thought. So it seems to me that um, you're using this count as your measure of, of facial complexity. And it's kind of like the old dispute about what's the right measure of species diversity. You know, so that it, your measure is like species richness, and then there are these evenness measures that measure, mm -hmm. you know, how variable things are versus a, it seemed like that would capture a different dimension of, mm -hmm. of uh, rather than just, um, you know, how much there was variation from one region, one facial region to the other, rather than just how many yeah. bright colored things there were. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a, that's a very interesting point. The models would be a little bit more harder to, um, well, that's Jessica, I think Jessica has been trying to play with some data, too, and how different parts could change from, Species. And it's and, and it's uh, more difficult, but yeah, I mean there there are many different ways that which we could look at these data, uh, and we're still just scratching the surface of what we, we can do to investigate these patterns. Back to the sexual dimorphism for a minute before discarding that sexual selection is involved. Mm -hmm. It might be interesting to look at um, symmetry of those patterns mm -hmm. because intense markings could make it easier to detect asymmetry. Mm -hmm. And uh, so intense markings might occur more frequently in those species where there's a great deal of sexual selection going on. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Yeah, we have it. of nature of social, what the social demands might be. So this idea about the bare faces being easier. It seems to me the bare faces would be really important for when you have a lot of interactions that are sort of pretty, at pretty close range, mm -hmm. rather than, you know, you're two trees away, because, you know, I can't see your face that well from two trees away. Um, yeah, so look, some of the data that we're gathering are also density and size of, of the ranges, too, which you probably get it. Maybe you were thinking how we could account for as well. So I, I have a question about the disruptive coloration idea in the bats, which is, this is again something I know nothing about. But um, my perhaps naive impression is that disruptive coloration is most likely to be effective when animals are moving, right? So if you know there's a whole herd of critters moving across the, mm -hmm. the savanna or whatever, and they got these odd markings, then it's very hard for me to pick out individuals. Mm -hmm. But if bats are mostly vulnerable to predation when they're asleep, um, does disruptive coloration actually play a role? Yeah, so that's, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because they actually, they're not standing still for the whole day. They are, they are moving and switching places, even within those roosts, and they're you know, shaking and, and, and grooming as well. Maybe, I don't know if that could account as much as you know, individuals moving across a, a region. Um, but that, that could actually get, get to, um, you know, disruptive coloration would probably be useful to that. And also, as I mentioned, uh, background matching might also be uh, playing a role there with this different pattern of light. Yeah. Yeah, Mike. What, what are the main predators on the uh, guys that are using under intense or whatever? Are they visual predators? Or are they During snakes? The day, yeah. Or? yeah, I have, yeah, lots of, lots of snakes, uh, some carnivores. Uh, you get birds of prey, and then, um, yeah, and then at night is a different story. Birds of prey? Yeah. How, how do they find them? Yeah, well, you have some of those uh, bats that are roosting, just hanging. Oh, yeah. Okay. Eat, so. Yeah, those guys. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. so, I was just going to follow up on that point. You mentioned zebras, and it, I, I read something recently that yeah. it's a disruptive coloration argument, but it's about mm -hmm. parasitism. Right? I saw that. I saw so that. I'm, I'm curious whether you, you would think that group size is positively correlated with degree of parasitism. I, I don't know whether there are any data in bats that speak Yeah, to but in zebras, it was specifically, it was a tabanet flies, yeah. so it was going to have to do with the visual system of, of the 
parasitic, the parasite. yeah, of the parasite. And I don't, I don't, I don't think that's what's going on in bats. And I'm not sure I buy that's what's going on in zebras okay. either. But uh, yeah, it, it would be an interesting thing to look into. I have a couple of data questions. One's just odd and odd to be that. So you have all diurnal creatures except owl monkeys. Uh, mm -hmm. And yet owl monkeys were way out at your extreme of, of brightly colored yes. faces. Uh, does that worry you at all? That, uh, so it made me think a lot. And then recently I actually uh, met with a colleague and he was studying um, circadian rhythms in, in owl monkeys. Uh -huh. And one interesting pattern that he's found is that actually owl monkeys are more active uh, during the full moon. So there's a, in the environments where they live, I mean, when there's full moon, you can basically, you can read a book. It's, it's so much light. So they, they can actually, are, they have these really big eyes. So they're actually able to, to see these patterns. What we also had thought um, before is that uh, we see this striking pattern, but they're also monochromatic, too. So it could be that they have a striking mm -hmm. pattern. Eyes. And you, their visual system, is, is it loaded up with, with black and white receptors? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and the other question is, I, want, I just wonder, so when you showed us that map of South America with east and west and north and south, <coughs> I couldn't see why the east was where we should have um, brightly. So I would have thought the Llanos, for example, would have been the brightest place, and, mm -hmm. and yet they're central or maybe even a little west, and maybe the Pantanal, I don't know. I mean, this, uh, so could you explain why you came up with the east, west, north, south, bright, dark? Uh, I thought maybe I, mis I misunderstood you, but I thought you were saying east was light, w brighter sunlight, west was more forest. Yeah, in general, yeah, put the potential just well, general. It didn't look like it fit. Maybe yeah. you could show us the map. And yeah, I can show you the map. That's good. Yeah, so that, uh, the east, where's my pointer? Oh. The east, uh, west, uh, I mean, the west-east gradient would be mostly driven by, by these regions here, which uh, Jessica, who has done a lot of field work there, could probably correct me if I'm wrong, it tend to be more, more up in, right? And, and drier. Right, so the Cejado and right. Pachinga habitats are, yeah. are much more open. They're like the Llanos yeah. that you were talking yeah, about. So you're talking, yeah, so these, these regions here, yeah. So why not just do it by insulation or something? Rather than latitude, it seems like it would be much more. Yeah, more refined. Well, yeah. I mean, it looks yeah. like. Yeah, we, we could try that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Those regions that you outlined, mm -hmm. do they correspond to the developmental trajectories of those cell masses mm -hmm. in an embryo? Is that how you chose those, or that, that's just from uh, that is very hard to tell, especially at, at this large scale of, of primates. Uh, my guess is, um, I'm trying to rewind and think about, because the, the re this region here uh, tends to develop uh, at once, but that's not true for all the other regions. So I would, I would think that it, it's not, but the truth is that we don't have data to really say that that's the case in the top level primates. I only bring it up because yeah. it would put constraints on exactly what the pattern is. Right, right. Uh, you know, the variation that, that is yeah. possible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it also emphasizes the possibility that markings reveal symmetry mm -hmm. towards disruption. Yeah, yeah. That is a good point, but I haven't, I haven't run across um, any studies of like migration of like uh, the Milano blasts across the, the phase of uh, developing. Embryos in your top of all of primates. Um, but yeah, interesting. So, so are you doing some uh, African primates as well? Yeah. <laughs> How's that going? <laughs> I can show you. <laughs> and these are, these are, new, these are new data. These are new data from my collaborators as well. So I just I just ran this analysis a few days ago. Um, I, I was thinking, yeah, I mean, I was thinking about the boots of things, these black faces, and, you know, really plain black faces. All those forest monkeys would. And they're not all that easy to talk apart if you're not so. Okay, so here it is. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I finished slide. So, this is going to be what I'm going to show you is the, these are the results for the response variable being facial complexity 
and then the predictive variable, it's only the group size. So it's a very rough analysis. And then these are the signs of the slopes. <laughs> so if you look at across all the old world primates, um, except for uh, lemurs and, uh, and parsiers, the sign is positive, which is the opposite of what I just showed you today, and it's significant. However, uh, if you look closely at what groups are driving this trend, it's only these guys here. Uh, so, you know, uh, the group that contains the, the Gwenans and uh, manga bays, you know, these like really brightly colored faces. And then that relationship is not in any of the other groups. You see that our slopes are either close to zero or negative. So, this is, this is really, I thought this was really interesting, and I still, you know, thinking about what, what this all means because I just, just run the analysis. Uh, so, but you can see that there's a, a different trend, but it's, it's, it will be only driven by this particular group. And I, I would still, I think I want to still keep breaking it down and see yeah, like which say, particular. It's not all of them. Right, exactly, exactly. So, which particular lineage is, is driving? Aren't, aren't some of those forest monkeys like Lennon's? Uh, really they have a lot of yeah. multi species groupings for us. Uh, mm -hmm. Vervets and macaques and baboons, they're, you know, yeah. they're by themselves or trying to eat the other ones. But, uh, right. Uh, they do, and they have this like really striking also facial displays and vocalizations. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So they're, they're definitely using this, this color patterns to, to signal um, identity or, or other type of information. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So is there a reason to consider predation risk in primates? Because the same, the same cues that will make it easy for other conspecifics mm -hmm. to recognize you will make it easier for predators to recognize Definitely. you. Definitely, yeah. And is there, have you run any analysis considering that? Or? Uh, no, I haven't, I haven't. Uh, so it would be data that are a little bit more harder uh, to get, uh, but yeah, that's really interesting. I know there, there are some studies that have looked at um, count evolution of counter shading across primates mm -hmm. and um, how they relate to uh, this uh, locomotion, the type of locomotion that they use and how much time they spend um, you know, as in quadrupedal locomotion versus sitting, and they do find a really nice correlation between uh, those type of coloration and then being quadrupedal, which kind of suggests that uh, that type of like, overall body coloration has to do with uh, reducing creativeness.